welcome to the Man in a Podcast, Jamie. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I don't have my headphones on. <laughs> They're on now, though. They're on Because now. I can't hear you when you're sitting right next to me if I don't have my headphones on. See, watch. I can't hear talk. Is that because of old age? Or? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Liz, you're just gonna let him talk to I me mean, like that? We got an intro to do. And this this conversation is a really important one. Eldra Jackson, who was formerly incarcerated at Folsom Prison, is uh, now a incredible speaker. I had the, the great pleasure of seeing him at TED Women the year after I did my TED Talk. And um, he is the executive director of uh, Inside Circle, which is just this incredible organization that helps rehabilitate and heal inmates. This man <laughs> is something else. Mm. So special. Mm. And I uh, cannot wait for uh, our listeners to, to hear it. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Super exciting. It's gonna be a good one. I'm excited for what we are about to get into. Mm-hmm. And how are you, Liz? I'm feeling also enthralled uh, and excited <laughs> about all the wisdom that we're going to absorb from this conversation mm. with this magical human. Shall we? Dive in. We will be right back with Elder Jackson. This is Man Enough. Hey, everyone. Don't you think the word slow is just right? Like if you're describing a relaxed vacation or a sloth, or if you're describing QuickBooks, more like slow books. Yeah, that's right. I said it, slow books. I mean, who wants to be slowed down with manual processes, integration difficulties, glitchy delays, all those things that leave you scrambling for the numbers you need. So now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system. Because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, your inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. And with NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time, no matter how big your business grows. But failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. But check this out. Right now, special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program only for those ready to switch today. Head to NetSuite.com slash man enough right now. Get special financing at NetSuite.com slash man enough. Again, that's NetSuite.com slash man enough. Hello and welcome back to the Man Enough Podcast. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And Eldra Jackson. Yes, sir. (laughs) Hello. Hello, hello. I'm so happy that you are here. I was so blessed to be able to meet you at TED Women when you gave your TED Talk. Yes, sir. I'll never forget giving you that hug outside and just knowing that that I had to be in your life in some way. And I'm so grateful that you agreed to come and join us on the Man Enough Podcast. Oh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today on the Man Enough Podcast. (laughs) Uh, If it's okay... Liz Plank has some things to say mm-hmm. about you. About I'm going to read beautiful, beautiful bio. Yes, all of these amazing accomplishments. So, Eldra, you are a writer. You're a sought after public speaker on the topics of at risk youth advocacy, effective criminal justice rehabilitation, and turning around toxic masculinity. You're the co executive director of Inside Circle, a healing community. There's an amazing movie about yes. it. You should all go see. And organization that empowers impacted people to lead change from within mm-hmm. and provides opportunities opportunities for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people to heal and serve themselves and others through human connection. Human connection. Who would have thought? Beautiful. Elder Jackson. Beautiful work that you do. Welcome to the show, my man. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, thank you for having me here today. So we start every interview with this question. When was the last time you didn't feel enough? <clears throat> the last time I didn't feel enough. Hmm. What is today? Friday. The last <laughs> time I didn't feel enough was Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What happened? Well, I, I live in Northern California and I, I, I live in a town that is under evacuation warning for the Caldor fire. Hmm. And so when the, when, when the evacuation order came in, I immediately went into get it done mode. So feeling shut off, Mm. 
And and I got the opportunity. I was I was sitting in the doctor's office yesterday with my wife and she was expressing how overwhelming it was for her because this is the first time she's ever experienced something like this. And I could see the 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 fear in her in that moment and and uh, how everything was weighing on her with us having to pack and move things to a safe location and her being up with alarms going off every hour to check and see if we had to evacuate. And, and I realized in that moment that when I went into just get it done mode, I shut my feelings off mm. and I shut off that connection to be open to uh, being aware of what was happening for the people around me, the people close to me. Mm. It's so interesting how when we shut our feelings off, when we go into that fight or flight mode, that get it done mode, that protection mode, that rational part of our brain, we lose touch with not just other people, but ourselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. vice versa. We like, we got no idea what's happening mm -hmm. like with your wife. And I just think that's so beautiful that you can reflect like that. You put it, you yeah. put it so wonderfully. And that's really at the core of the work that you do with the circle. And I want to really have you I I explain to our listeners who, who may not be familiar, what is the circle and mm -hmm. the work that you do across, not just prisons across America, but with men, that so mm -hmm. many men who are locked up are, have been in fight or flight maybe their entire lives, mm -hmm. right? That we see these men, um, we, we, we forget that most of the people who are incarcerated were victims at one point in their lives, right? And that's often what leads to that path in a society where we see prisons as like a, the way to rehabilitate broken men. Like it's literally like that, right? There are so many men who are, who are locked up and we think in this law and order kind of society based on this ideal of masculinity that that's how we're going to fix men. Mm. But you have a mm. very different approach and can you tell us about it? Uh, certainly. Uh, you, you asked what, what is it that we do in circle? Uh, well, what we do in circle plainly is uh, provide a space for individuals to uh, look at themselves. And, and what I'm gonna do here is uh, utilize one of the principles that we use in, in circle, and I'll speak from the I perspective. What I am able to do in circle is look at the places in my life that don't work. Mm -hmm. And then begin to make a decision once I become aware about the things that don't work figure out what, if anything, I'm willing to do about that moving forward. Cause I don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But for me, once I got to the place where I realized that there were things for me that weren't working, not only for me, but for uh, uh, folks in my life, then, you know, I, I was equipped with information and I felt a sense of responsibility to do something about that. And so what we do in circle is, 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 is challenge old thinking challenge old ways of being in a container that's safe and in a healthy way, not in a, uh, a beat you down masochistic type of way, but in a healthy, supportive, holding and nurturing environment. That's what was offered to me. And, and that's what we continue to do with this work with Inside Circle. Mm -hmm. and, and you spoke about uh, what we do with the criminal justice system, locking you know folks away. Over 80% of the people that we lock away we'll be returning to the community. Not everybody mm -hmm. goes away for life. Not everybody goes uh, to the death house. And so if we're just putting people in places where they're continuing to be poked and prodded and victimized and traumatized, and then we release them back into the wild, mm -hmm. what do you think we're gonna get? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are listening to the Man Enough Podcast. We will be right back. Hey there. Today's episode of the Man Enough Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Athletic Greens, the health and wellness company that makes comprehensive daily nutrition really, really simple. And I can vouch for them because I have been taking my Athletic Greens every morning the last few weeks and having all of my vitamins and minerals going through my body that I need in a given day in one shot. That's because one scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, greens, superfood blend, and all in one tiny little serving. Look, we're all busy. 
right? And we don't always take care of our bodies. I know I am one of those people. And it's so important, especially when we're busy, to give our body what it needs. This podcast is giving your heart and your soul what it needs. And I'm in full support of making sure that we're all taking our vitamins and minerals and giving our body what it needs. One of the other things I love about Athletic Greens is that they are evolving as their research evolves. It's like what we're talking about on Man Enough. We are always evolving. We're always trying to get better. We can't be stuck in the past. And while most nutrition products come to market never evolve, Athletic Greens is obsessively improving their AG1 based on the latest research. They've had 53 improvements over the last decade and counting. They continue to invest high quality and reputable sources of each ingredient, and they go above and beyond. So join the movement of athletes and life leads and moms and dads and rookies and first timers and everyone in between and take control of your health and put the good stuff in your body. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D, which is so critical, especially right now, and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash man enough today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash man enough and take control of your health and give AG1 a try. You won't be disappointed. All right. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. Can we talk about your your past a bit? Sure. Uh, I, I was in prison for 24 years. 24 years. Yes, sir. And you um, you talk about what happened to you as a child. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I am, it, I find it so interesting as I'm sitting next to my best friend here who had a very similar situation um, mm-hmm. in some ways as a child. And, um, and I just would love if you're willing to share some of what you experienced as a child and maybe how that led to where you ended up and your journey out. Certainly. Certainly, certainly. And what what I was able to uh, access and tap into and and, and circle was was childhood trauma. And that childhood trauma was was sexual in nature. And what I recognized is that what I was doing was developing a relationship with what intimacy looks like. I was developing a relationship with what sexuality meant. I was developing a relationship with what contact with another human in that vein was or was not. And what I was able to get to in circle is, and it played out in my life, you know, uh, that, that taught me, that informed me what power looked like. That, that informed me that, you know, I was not somebody who wanted to be a victim anymore in my life. And if there was a situation where there was a victim victimizer, uh, a dynamic, I was going to be the victimizer. If there was going to be a dynamic where power was involved, I know what power looks like and I'm going to be the one wielding the power. And and so I I, I went through life. With that self-talk inside of me, developed at seven years old, eight years old, nine years old and not having uh, the ability to articulate it to the people around me in my life and the people in my life not being equipped with uh, the knowledge to ask the questions that might have revealed that when I was acting out, you know, and, and doing things that were labeled, oh, you know, just boys being boys and, 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 and that sort of thing, you know, who's to say what may have come from that, but it didn't, it played out the way that it did. And, uh, I wound up making some choices and decisions as a teenager that, uh, ultimately led to me serving life in prison based on you know, the information that I took in and the decisions that I made at, you know, a, a, a very young age, you know, that seven year old boy, that eight year old boy, that nine year old boy was driving the bus for me when I was 14, when I was 19, when I was 29, when situations cropped up that would trigger that power dynamic in my mind that would trigger that, you know, uh, defense mechanism in my mind. Yeah, not me. It's going to be you. Somebody's going to get crushed today and it's not going to be me. Man, um, I got so much. You, I believe, demonstrate transformation. You demonstrate accountability. Everything I've seen that you have done 
from the beginning to the end is accountability. Um, I haven't seen you deflect. You own your choices. You own your growth. Um, Well, actually, I don't even want to say you own your growth. You give your growth to other things like circle um, and like self-reflection and um, giving it to a higher power and things. So um, I'm really proud to see a man do that. And it's and it's uh, healing for me to hear because I do have some similar experience to your life. Also was molested from the time I was seven to about 17. And and that effect, I didn't realize till I was older. And as I got older, I started making choices. Now, I didn't end up in prison. I didn't do something in the same way that you did. But um, I equally hurt people um, mm-hmm. in my choices, being unfaithful to women, um, destroying marriages, destroying other people, infiltrating other marriages. So I had my own prison, uh, my prison of self, um, isolated from family and friends and my place in the world, right? So... Um, How do you get out of that? There's a lot of men in the world that have similar experiences. Maybe didn't spend time in prison, didn't spend time isolated from the world, but they've done something or experienced Mm -hmm. pain. Um, Mm -hmm. And how do we get out of that? And I talk about this all the time and what you're doing and what I'm so, so thrilled to hear and also excited for people to hear your story because there are boys out there now that are in it and you're giving them permission to be vulnerable and also still be a man. Because when I look at you right now, I see a strong ass man. What you do, I want my son to watch. And it makes me emotional also because uh, this, this, this hurts all people in the world. Everybody harms people. Mm-hmm. But in our country, um, black people who harm people are forever seen as perpetrators, are forever seen as uh, uh, ones that only um, uh, bring destruction. Uh, we are able to forgive other people a bit more. So when I see someone like you own it, uh, it really, really is ins- inspirational. Makes me proud and, and happy to, to know you. So let me ask you a question with what I'm feeling. Tell me why, outside of your own growth and your own elevation of spirit, why you think your story is so important to be shared with the world? Why is it important um, for a circle for men to come in this um, and find their accountability. <laughs> you you use the word important and 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 my ego hmm. shirks away from that. And what I would say is it is a tool that serves a purpose to support others in understanding and realizing that they are not the only ones, Mm -hmm. that they don't have to do this alone. And if me speaking about what happened to me and you speaking about what happened to you gives someone else the courage to speak out about what they're going through, hopefully they can get the support that they need to begin the road to healing sooner than I did because I didn't start my healing until I was serving a life sentence in California. Mm-hmm. Hopefully a seven year old boy can start healing, you know, in the bosom of his household with people who love him and people who uh, uh, care about him while he's in the community and he can go on and, and, and find a cure for cancer or she or whoever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about brotherhood and, and just relationships between men. Um, one of the things about the prison industrial complex is there are many things that are, that are wrong with it, uh, but it's extremely unproductive, right? The goal, the intended goal, you know, for the people who believe in this system is that we are going to reform men, we're going to fix men or fix people. And obviously most of the people who end up being incarcerated are black men, black and brown men uh, because of institutionalized racism. But the prison paradox, which is a real term that was coined by uh, Don Steeman, is that actually putting more people in jail does not reduce crime. It is we, we are putting more and more people in jail. Has crime gone down? No. And actually what happens is the reverse. So the more you incarcerate uh, inside a community, uh, the more crime actually increases because you're breaking those social ties. You're breaking that mm-hmm. community. Right. And Mm -hmm. social ties, brotherhood, relationships, friendships, love, connection. Those are the things that actually 
protect us as humans. And so I'm wondering, you know, what could be the alternative to the system that we have now for men to be uh, loved and and connected with each other and for, and for men to do better as a whole than what we have right now? Hmm. <clears throat> the, the alternative from my perspective is uh, uh, the capacity for Inside Circle to be available or something like it to anybody who has done something that our society has deemed is uh, uh, antisocial. And so if you, if, if you have these colonies, uh, these penal colonies where we're sending folks off to, we transform them from places of uh, 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 punishment and isolation into houses of healing, mm. houses of support. So from day mm. one, we have diagnostics going on and, and, and an individual is being interviewed and uh, uh, sat down and we're figuring out what the triggers are. Where does this come from? Because this stuff doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Yeah. Mm. The action and the rationale, it takes something for me to uh, be able to hit somebody in the head with a claw hammer and laugh. I wasn't born like that. So mm. what is it along the way that happened that triggered me to be able to get to that place? There was a break somewhere. So if we're diagnosing folks and if we're sitting with folks and turning prisons into trauma centers, then from day one, what we're doing is providing a space for folks to begin to be able to heal. And then we build out a program of, of not just healing, but reintegration. And we're preparing them to then reintegrate back into society. Mm -hmm. Because when I left, I was gone for 24 years. Hell, a uh, cell phone was a backpack, a great <laughs> big Motorola battery pack. And, yes, and right. when I came home, everybody had a computer in their pocket. So it's about mm. healing as well as planning for reintegration back mm. into uh, the, the, the community, mm. because that's a huge return on investment mm. for everyone. Mm. That's right. That was an interesting visual um, when you said that prison should be trauma centers. And I just thought of the ER, right? And, you know, you have these trained doctors who've gone to medical school for a decade to handle mm -hmm. the scariest, most dangerous traumas mm -hmm. with a goal of saving a life, with a goal of fixing the person, getting them back to their life. And... And like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And then reintegration. Like if we're going to be spending money on that's what we should be doing is these are the people that need it the most. Yeah. You go to the ER, you need it the most. You need it now. Mm -hmm. Right? You've been inflicted with trauma. Mm -hmm. Like we should be rushing to help versus banishing. Mm -hmm. And to your point too, we isolate. When does isolating anyone ever work? Ever worked? work. Right. No. Especially if you're traumatized, especially if you've been a victim of violence. Right. Mm -hmm. Isolating only makes things worse. Well, it's actually increasing mm -hmm. connection. That should be the first thing that we do. And can I piggyback off that? Because I'd love to know, speaking of isolation and your specific journey, um, what was prison like for you? Because I know that when you first got there, you were isolated a lot. Mm -hmm. Like you were sent mm -hmm. to. Do they call it isolation? Solitary confinement. Yeah, solitary Torture. confinement is what they call it on HBO. Mm -hmm. It's the hole. The hole. Right. Yeah. So you were sent to the yeah. hole. Uh, can, can you just, Oof. yeah, can, can you talk about, because um, how old were you when you went in? 17, 18? I was 19. 19. So can you talk about the experience in prison and your adjustment period and isolation, as Liz was saying, and then how you found Inside Circle? Mm. Uh, well, my adjustment period, you know, to isolation in the whole was not something that took a long time. It was something that, you know, based on things that happened to me earlier in life and the way that I was raised, I was built for that in my mind. Mm. I was built for isolation. I was already living in isolation. Mm. I was in prison long before, you know, they put a, a, a pair of handcuffs on me. I was in prison when I was in the community. I was in prison before I went out into the gutter and picked up uh, a gang banging and crack slanging. I was already I was in prison when I was a, a star athlete playing baseball and, and people saw, you know, a picture because that's all I wanted them to see was what they saw on the field. I was isolated then. Nobody knew me. I didn't have, you know, I, I had. We called one another friends, but I had associates. People didn't know me. 
nobody got inside of this and I didn't give anything from outside of this out to the world. You know, I was living in a holding place, not quite heaven, not quite hell, that place where, you know, you don't know w which way you're going to go. It's just like a misty, cloudy, formless place. Mm. So being in physical isolation in prison, that was nothing for me. Hmm. Because I was already formatted in my mind to be alone. I was already formatted in my mind to be in a box. That was comfortable. Being in a box, being in the hole was comfortable for me because I didn't have to be around people. I could let my guard down. I could breathe. I could just hmm. and didn't have to worry about who's looking, who's watching, what air I have to put on, what weakness not to let somebody see. Mm -hmm. So the hole was hell vacation. Hmm. So then you got when you found the inner circle, why did you finally submit to that? Hmm. Well, while I was in the hole for the last time, they, they have a classification system and everybody in the hole is a certain designation. And by this time, I had been to the hole so many times. And, and for the you know episode that I was in, they were like, OK, you're standalone walk alone. And, and what standalone walk alone is, is uh, you live in a cell by yourself and you go out to the yard by yourself everywhere you go. You're, you know, you got shackles on your feet and you got belly chains around your waist. And uh, I'm looking at, you know, Charles Manson and Sirhan Sirhan, and they're able to go out and about with other folks. And in my mind, these cats are monsters. In my mind, you know, these this is this is Satan and, and Satan's right hand man. Good Lord. As far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But I hit, you know, what I call my rock bottom in the hole at that time understanding that I was in the place that I was in because of what I was doing. All of a sudden, you know, it's not these external forces. It's not that Pookie snitched on me. It's not that this cat disrespected me and he had to be disciplined. And so that opened up a crack for me to be available for something like Inside Circle to come along once I was released from the hole. Hmm. And how, how did, uh, so first of all, how long were you in the hole? That time I was in the hole for 18 months. Oh my God. Jesus. And is it, and I'm sorry if it's an ignorant question, but is it at all like you see in the movies or TV? Is it literally just a hole and they just bring you food and slide it under the door? Is there any human interaction? What is that, what is that like? They don't, they don't slide it under the door. They slide it through a slot in the middle of the door. So it's not coming in on the ground, but it is coming in a slot that's got a lock on it and a little flat, like, you know, the bed of a truck. They lower that, they slide the tray in, you take the tray off, they slam the slot back, back and, you know, put the master lock back on it. Uh, the human interaction is, you know, with the guards, you know, coming to your door, telling you to cuff up. So you turn around, uh, put your wrist together, stick them, you know, behind your back through the uh, uh, the same slot that your food comes in. They escort you, you know, to whatever appointments you have. If you're going to see the doctor, or dentist, uh, going out to the yard and, and, and that's it. Come get you every couple of days, put you in a shower that's got a cage on it. And, and, and you got five minutes. The water's controlled by somebody in the gun tower. When they push that button, the five minute timer starts. When that five minutes is over, the water goes off. You better have soaked up and rinsed off because it's, it's over. Tell me. <laughs> We don't even treat animals like this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man. That's right. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. So you've done these things that got you there. Then you continued doing yes, things while you were there. Yes, sir. Then you started to find yourself. What was yes, it that, uh, uh, that they were able to see in you that allowed them to release you? Mm. What they saw in me, I'm assuming, you know, speaking for them, was uh, my ability to look at who I was. And when I say who I was, not who I was when I was sitting in front of them in, in that boardroom, but, but who that person was that was able to rationalize doing the things that I was doing in the community and how I got to that point. Being able to sit down and talk to them and, and, and reconstruct moment by moment, point by point, my entire life and and where the the, the 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 events happen for my decision making process mm -hmm. and who that person was 
that was basically a monster. You know, I had to be able to articulate to those folks my understanding of who I was, how I got there, what I had done to uh, address that and what my plans were to make certain I was not going to backslide into that if I was released back into the community. So what you said was, oh, OK, because I'm not as much interested in how they saw you. Right. Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, your liberation and your freedom and your your spirit is not at, at the uh is not for, in my opinion, for someone else to determine. Mm -hmm. um, even mm -hmm. though I understand that's what they use in order to consider it. More interested <clears throat> in the fact that you yourself was transformed. So what I hear is that once you found community, once you were able to really show the inside of who you were, where you guarded so much of your life, uh, once you had touch, <clears throat> feelings, friendship, um, vulnerability, that's when you started to find yourself. That's when your spirit was transformed. Without a doubt. And, and, and that shows that, you know, that shows through because you go before, I had to go before what they call uh, the BPH, border parole hearing. And it is a, uh, uh, a, a panel of, of governor, government appointees. They're appointed by the governor. Most of them are, you know, former wardens, chiefs of police, sheriffs, things like that. And, and you sit with those folks for hours mm -hmm. and go over your entire life. And, and these are the folks that are making the determination about yay or nay on whether somebody who has life with the possibility of parole will be released back into the community. Mm -hmm. So you better be pretty damn clear about who you are That's and right. why we're having this meeting here today. And a piece of that, you know, you mentioned community. Uh, uh, and, 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 and kinship and spirit. They need to see that. They need to feel that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think is powerful about that is that for people who are not in your situation, but in their daily lives, um, men who are just walking your everyday guy, um, who is in some turmoil, really the way that they, we find ourselves is through community, through being open, mm -hmm. vulnerable, mm -hmm. having real conversations, mm -hmm. having friendship, uh, being held accountable by other people, other friends that really tell us who we are, not us just living in our own mind. And so that leads me to a question for you. So now you're married. How long have you been married? Seven years. We've been married seven years. We've been together 15 years. My man, tell me what you do, uh, something tangible in your life now, in your marriage, how you treat her, uh, that uh, you feel, uh, not just for your wife, but is healthy and contributes to the betterment of humanity. Hmm. Something tangible that I do is every day take stock in what my impact is. And not just in what my impact is, but what my impact, what impact I want to have. And that's something that I do every day because what I did yesterday is history. It's not real. It doesn't exist. What I may do tomorrow is not real, it doesn't exist. But what am I doing today? What is my intention right now? And I seek to more often than not move from that place. Mm -hmm. So in simpler terms, I, 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 I try to think about other people before I think about myself, because mm -hmm. I know I how to be selfish. I know how to do that. I don't have to think about that. I gotta think about thinking about other people. That's work for me. <laughs> I love that. There, there's a there's a, something that I, I'm told in my faith. I'm a Baha'i and there's a man by mm -hmm. the name of Abdul Baha who tells us uh, when you are in such grief, when you are so low that you can't find your way out of it to immediately go and be of service to another. And then you will find that your pain dissipate. It's in the act of love towards humanity, towards the world, not really yourself. We got I feel like we got this whole thing backwards. Everyone's always about like, well, how do I make myself better? Make time for me. Yes, that's needed. But really. When you serve others, when you're selfless, uh, when you you go uh, um, give yourself, because that's how really to be of service, you have to give yourself. And when you start mm -hmm. doing that, that's when you start finding find healing. Um, so I, I love that that was one of your answers, brother. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can go back to Inside Circle and really, uh, for, for, for people who are listening, you know, you've, mm -hmm. I think, broken through some of the toughest uh, men uh, probably 
in the world. Uh, and, and again, just gleaning that from the documentary about about your work. I mean, those are some really, really tough conversations with people mm -hmm. who have been through a lot of trauma who are very armored. There's like many levels of armor that you have to mm -hmm. break through. So for people who are listening who want to do that with the men in their lives or men who are listening mm -hmm. who want to do that with themselves and their family or their community, how, what does that look like? What are the questions that they can start asking other men or that they can start asking themselves to mm -hmm. do that work? Two, two questions to ask folks. Uh, what are you afraid of? And what's at risk? Mm. What, what, what is the risk for you not opening up? What is the risk of you not doing this work? What do you lose mm. if you do this? And you put the ball in their court because it's not something that I can do. I can't convince someone to do this. That's not what this work is. It's not trying to make somebody do anything because mm -hmm. what we're doing there is, 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 is traumatizing somebody all over again and mm -hmm. giving them the idea that they are not good enough, giving them the idea that they are wrong or they should be doing something that they're not doing. And I'm putting my bullshit onto them. Mm -hmm. So that's not what this work is about. It's about asking an individual questions and supporting them in mm. finding what works for them. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, can I ask you a follow up, Eldra? When you sure. ask, because I've had this happen, where you ask a man what he's afraid of and he says nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you say then? Well, the, the next thing that I would ask is, okay, if, if they're not afraid of anything, what keeps you from being the best you that you can be? Mm. That's a good way to get into it. Are you? showing up as your best person. Mm. It's always inward reflection. Yeah. Keep sending them back into themselves. Into, That's right. right. Okay, if I'm not afraid of anything, okay, now I got to start thinking about, am I showing up in my best? Mm. Is there more that I could be doing? Mm -hmm. Am I satisfied where, you know, then they start to drill down off into that. They gonna, they gonna, they gonna find it. That's mm. right. Sometimes it's a get journey there. to get there, but they'll yeah. get there. Mm -hmm. Liz is gonna have Eldra on speed dial when she's with, <laughs> When she's with men. When I'm on first yeah. dates. What are you afraid of? <laughs> what are you afraid of? Nothing. You. Hold, hold that thought. Hey, Eldra. <laughs> uh, can you talk to him for a second? I would love that. Five That'd minutes later, service. he's crying. Yes, that's that's the goal. Um, that's the goal. Uh, uh, backtrack a little bit for me, Eldra. You met your wife while you were in prison. Yes, sir. Mm. You guys became pen pals. Is that true? We, we we started writing and a couple of months after that, we started visiting and she served my last eight years with me, not knowing, and I was still under a life sentence, you know, not knowing. And, you know, we both had faith that one day I would be released, but not knowing when that day would be wow. or realistically, if it would come. So how, how did you meet? How did this, how did, I'm so curious, how did this start? <laughs> Well, my wife, uh, at the time she was working in a medical office and uh, there was a lady there that she was friends with. And one of my associates was incarcerated with me and they were dating. And, and so, you know, this young lady would be reading letters and, and would get telephone calls from, from my associate. And, uh, she talked to my wife about her boyfriend and, uh, she eventually told her that he was incarcerated. And she asked, you know, uh, uh, Holly, my wife, if, if she wanted to write somebody in. And of course, her answer was, hell no. She comes from a, a, a very different background than I come from. She got a, uh, a a message, you know, from her her higher power, God, that told her that that was an opportunity for her to be of service and uh, uh, minister to someone and, and help them, you know, change their life. Mm -hmm. So that's what she went into it for. That's where the pen pal mm. relationship started. What I, <laughs> what I love about that, do you mind sharing your wife's name? Holly. Holly. What I love about Holly already is um, a lot of people think that, she, that uh, someone sitting there is unredeemable, mm -hmm. uh, does not see their humanity. Holly was. Holly was able to see through all that because... Uh, you are this spectacular spirit. And for, for her to see that and not only see some of your actions, my wife too, um, when I uh, started dating her, uh, she knew all my stuff. And mm -hmm. we had people in our circle that were saying, uh, are you sure you wanna be with him? 
you know, he's been unfaithful. You know, he's uh, lied about this and done this and this and tried to talk her out of being with me. Uh, but she was still able to see my spirit. <laughs> um, and w- what I love about Holly in, in this regard and that she was able to see you and love you is that it also <laughs> demonstrates to other people uh, to not give up hope, to not give up on people, to to um, you demonstrate that for all the people that have been incarcerated, they're all humans. They're all people that have pain and have suffered and have reason that, that got them there. I'm not excusing the behavior as you have not excused yours. However, that doesn't mean that we don't deserve redemption or love or compassion or an opportunity to be transformed. And mm-hmm. um, and when you find a person that can see that, um, it makes me really proud of them and happy <laughs> and hopeful. You know that we gotta have Holly on the it. show. I yes, know. yes. Damn. We gotta have a marriage episode with mm. you guys because I just what I find so fascinating is it started as pen pals. You probably didn't even know what she looked like. No. So you fell in love over time with words and her character and what you guys talked about. And in in our faith, Jamie and I are both Baha'is. The idea of dating is investigating character, mm-hmm. and I find that so fascinating. It's investigating character. Um, and, you know, to, to be in prison for life, have a pen pal, and have that turn into love, that's the movie I want to go see. Mm-hmm. We'll have a separate talk, Eldra, after this. <laughs> but that's, that is beautiful. Now, what about, what about those letters? What about your wife um, mm-hmm. made you fall for her? How did that, how mm. did that go from a, a woman who's trying to be of service and minister to you to a relationship mm. uh the lost art of communication and two people just talking to each other about their hopes their dreams their fears uh me sharing with her uh exactly who i was by this time i had started you know to uh participate in inside circle so i was at a uh, a heightened state of uh my emotional development and starting to get in touch with my emotional intelligence and my social intelligence. And, and so I was, you know, uh, completely open with her, you know, who I am, where I'm from, what I do, you know, where, where my shadow shows up, how it shows up (laughs) when I'm doing this, this is what this means. So if you see this, the way to get me out of this is by countering it and saying this, and that'll bring me back, you know, to my level of awareness and just, you know, sharing that sort of thing with her and, 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 teaching her how to do it and and the and, and the relationship developed you know over time in that and and i credit it to you know what i see a huge lack of out here in the world today is is, is simple communication mm-hmm. you know people just being open and honest and talking about what's what you know you said this and i didn't like that you know people now are are afraid to hurt somebody's feelings and it's not necessarily about hurting somebody's feelings it's about you know, communicating what's going on with you. I don't know what's going on with you if you don't tell me. I'm not smart enough to be able to read your brain. I'm, I haven't developed that yet. I, I'm re- I'm a man. I'm simple. I need you to tell me what's going on with you. I'm not gonna figure it out. Hmm. Hmm. Seems like we. It feels. It seems like we need to go backwards. Like we're, <sighs> we have all this technology, all these dating apps, <laughs> yeah. that are helping us try to find the people we love. Right? We have you know, random reward theory Mm -hmm. and swiping and you don't know who you're going to get next and all this stuff. And Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like there needs to be an app called like pen pal. (laughs) Where it is just like pen pal. So we can get to know who the other person Mm -hmm. is. I love it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hey, tying this into our, uh, you know, our show of, you know, is man enough. Yes. Um, We talk about masculinity and some of the things that we might undefine, redefine and, and have a authentic discussion. And you um, talk about that also. Um, you, I know that, you, that you've used the phrase toxic masculinity and we've had discussions about that phrase, but for, forget the phrase itself. My question mm-hmm. is, what do you, uh, what do you think um, in terms of masculinity or some things that are powerful about it and some things that maybe we need to let go of or dispel you know, myths about it? I think some of the things that are powerful are a strong sense of self, a sense of purpose and a sense of being. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, some of the things that I think are, we, 
you know, that I need to uh, look at and be aware of is when my idea of masculinity infringes on the rights or freedoms of someone else, when it begins to make someone else uncomfortable, not because of some uh, uh, traumas or something that they may have, but because I'm doing way too much. Mm. Mm. And, and, and by that, what I mean is it can be very easy for me as a man to forget about what it is like to be a woman. Cause I've never been one, but when I think about, you know, the women in my life and, and, and I think about the fact that I've never in my life, you know, been scared hmm. at nine o'clock at night at the mall, going back to my car and seeing a white panel van and wondering if somebody in that van waiting to snatch me up. And so when I show up with my masculinity in an environment where there are women or there is a woman, uh, and I'm not aware of what that presence can be and how it can trigger and how it can be uh, 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 threatening, then that's not masculinity. That's in that's that's me being inconsiderate. Mm. Mm. And let me ask you uh, uh, one more question. Can I piggyback back off of oh, your I'm question? Sorry. Yes, actually, because it's a really good question, and I'm curious. You know, in this work, a lot of your work is helping men redefine uh, manhood and redefine how they view men and and their masculinity. But a lot is some of it also how they view women and changing the way that they view women. And do those things happen sort of in parallel? Or do you start with the masculinity part and then get to the treatment of women? Or Or is it the the other way around? Well, uh, let me, I'll I'll say this. We we start with dealing with the the whole individual. And Mm -hmm. so when I'm thinking about how to deal with other human beings, then it really doesn't matter whether or not it's a man or a woman because I'm conscious of how I'm treating another person. Mm. So empathy. Yes, ma'am. For everybody, including yourself. Which this, this is human work. Yes. You know, this mm. is that documentary was filmed in prison. It just happened to be filmed in prison. It mm. happened to have a lot of folks who were serving time in it. That's not prison work. That's not men's work. This is human work. Mm. This is something that every human being on the face of the planet can benefit from. This is why we have expanded to doing this and it's all inclusive now. We don't just sit with men. We sit with anybody who's willing to look at where they're screwed up. Mm. So let me just ask the follow question to that for myself is uh, tell me some feminine qualities that you um, think are wonderful and tell me also how they serve you. Mm. Uh, uh, gentleness. There's a gentleness that's just a natural part of femininity that serves me and reminding me I don't always have to be hard. Being a man, being masculine doesn't mean that I'm always hard as a brick wall. There is a gentleness that if I don't bring it to my five-year-old son, I'm teaching him a sickness. I'm training him to be sick. And I'm robbing him of the ability to get into contact with the entirety of his humanity, which will contribute to him being a well-rounded man. Mm-hmm. Love that. Speaking of fatherhood. Mm-hmm. Yes. You got how many kids? Two. 16 and five. Two young men. And five. Mm-hmm. Two young men. And your first son you had while in prison? Actually, we're we're a blended family. He's from uh, Holly's previous relationship. When we met, he was one years old. I've been in oh, his God. life his entire life. So you've been dad. You've been dad. Yes, sir. Um, you're very open about the importance of expressing emotion and being vulnerable in front of your children, mm-hmm. uh, which is something that I resonate with so much, something I'm practicing. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Certainly, it is something that I didn't see growing up uh, in my household, not from any, uh, not from my dad and not from the typical man or or what you should aspire to be. You never saw your dad cry? Hmm. I never saw him cry. I heard him cry once when his mother died and he was in another room. I didn't see it. Same. Yeah. That's what happened. And Lil, we had Lil Rel on the show. It's the mm-hmm. exact same story. Same story. Mm-hmm. You heard him cry. I, I heard him cry. 
and and not for I didn't hear it for a long time and it was muffled, but I can remember it because it mm-hmm. it stands out. You know, my dad was a drill sergeant, you know, military man, paratrooper, all of that. So mm-hmm. I can remember the time I heard him cry as a child. Wow. And now you are you're a dad and you're mm-hmm. doing something different. So I'm, doing? I'm doing something different. I said it earlier. There there's an aspect that I missed growing up. And, and that was uh, emotional intelligence. I didn't have emotional intelligence growing up. And, and I want to make certain that I do my part to equip, you know, the, the, the young men and the people in my life with emotional intelligence so they get to feel, you know, and, and when they're feeling, when they're in their emotions and something's going on, you know, I sit down with them and ask, OK, you feeling something and where's that come from? What do you want to do with that? I'm not going to try and stop you from throwing a, a, the, the five year old. I don't stop him from throwing tantrums and all of that. I make certain he's in a safe place. He's not going to hurt himself. And I let him know I'm going to be over here when you get done. You're ready to talk to me. <laughs> and then he'll come when he's ready to talk. I don't try to force it on him or make him stop. You know, shut up. Stop crying. You holler at me when you get done and, and we'll figure it out together. Mm-hmm. And when you are feeling a lot, when you mm-hmm. are emotional, when you mm-hmm. are vulnerable, um, you've talked about showing that to your kids. Mm-hmm. They get to see that. They get to see what it looks like. In in my opinion, if they don't, if I don't model for them what that looks like, then they don't know how yeah. mm-hmm. to do it. They don't have mm-hmm. the permission to do it. My my children look to me for permission to do things. Yeah. So if there's something that that I've taken off the table or it doesn't exist. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. So when it pops up in their world, they're ill-equipped with how to handle that, with how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. That's when bad things happen. Mm -hmm. When we send our kids out into the world and they're ill-equipped to deal with what's out there, because just because I have not equipped them to deal with what's out there doesn't mean that those things are going to go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's really worrying is, you know, from the data, when a father is incarcerated, uh, obviously it impacts their entire family, but it really impacts boys differently. And what they're finding is that there's not a cognitive delay, there's an emotional delay. So where we see really the effect happening is with what you're talking about, you know, wh- whatever you want to call it, emotional capability, right? And emotional intelligence. So how can we make sure that boys develop that? Hmm. It's for me, I, I think that it, it, it starts in the house. It starts from birth it, and, 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 and continues in school. It takes a village, you know, to raise, you know, children. We start to get rid of those old concepts about boys don't cry and telling boys to suck it up. You know, we stop telling boys, oh, that's just a, a, a little owie. You know, don't be a punk, you know, uh, uh, get up, get back in the game. You're not hurt that, you know, giving them those sorts of messages. And, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, little boys are snips and snails and puppy dog tails and, and little girls are sugar and spice and everything nice. What we're doing is giving messages about masculine and feminine roles mm-hmm. and what those energies look like. Mm-hmm. And then if I'm not conforming to those roles, something must be wrong with me. And then you, 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 you're contributing to all of these things around, you know, identity issues and, Shame. and whatnot. So we, yeah. we're, we're, we're doing, you know, ourselves as a society, a disservice when we don't support uh, emotional intelligence in our young males in the same fashion that we do with our young females. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I know from being a, a father, how important it is to demonstrate, um, in daily action how I feel about women, Mm -hmm. Um, to not just notice a woman and say, oh, isn't she pretty? Or isn't she this, or isn't she that? That Mm -hmm. um, that I daily, I'm always thinking about this with my sons. And in Mm -hmm. fact, if you were to ask my son, my 18 year old son, what is one way that you could break your your father's heart? He will undoubtedly say, hurt a woman, not champion a Mm -hmm. woman. That's the one thing that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. But I do that also by Every time we watch something on television, pointing out how brilliant this person is, making sure he reads a book from this woman, making sure that art or whatever it may be, that he is reminded all the time because the world is not telling him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all the time Mm -hmm. that women Mm -hmm. are nothing other than this. 
So yeah. if he sees me do it, and the research I have done, that boys that come from families, from men who tell them this and model that, those boys then carry that as well. They'll, they'll make mm-hmm. mistakes, mm-hmm. but they champion women much more than, uh, than your other person. Let me ask yeah. you quickly about, uh, you talk about uh, that you feel you owe the world, uh, you have an obligation uh, mm-hmm. to give back to the world in some way mm-hmm. uh, because of the destruction damage that you have caused it. What does that look like? What does that mean? Uh, well, for me, it goes back to impact and it goes back to how I show up because, you know, I've, I've done some things in my past and hurt, you know, a lot of people in, in some very foul ways. And they can't go back in history. Nobody wants to hear me say I'm sorry. You know, those those folks probably, you know, never want to see my face on this planet again. And 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 what I owe them is that I live my life in a way to make certain that nobody ever suffers by my hand in the way that they did. Mm, That's the least I can do for them. Mm. That's the very least that I can do for them. And then along the way, if I can affect others, you know, through this work and they don't bring harm to somebody in the world, Mm. then I'm paying that forward. My man, Mm, I love that. That's beautiful. You know, I've been saying for years when I became a parent, that my actions today are their memories tomorrow. But what I'm gonna change that to, what I realized as you were talking is, no, 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 my actions today are their actions tomorrow. And uh, I love that you are so damn self-aware. Um, and I, I had a random thought occur. We're living in this really strange polarizing time where, uh, there's a lot of debate and talk about this idea of cancel culture. I don't even know if I like to call it cancel culture, but accountability culture, maybe. Mm-hmm. This person did this, mm-hmm. this person said that. It's like, no, you don't, you don't just get to go to therapy. You don't just get to say, I'm sorry, but how do, you, how do you earn back someone's trust? What does that process of redemption and healing and restitution look like? Mm-hmm. 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 Well, I, I don't know if it looks like anything as far as, because if all I'm trying to do is get some position or station back in life, then it's very easy for you or anybody else to question mm-hmm. my motivation and the validity of what it appears to be. So for me, it, it, it's more about uh, how a person shows up, how mm-hmm. I show up and, 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 and what I demonstrate. You know, uh, I don't think that it's fair that anybody be uh, judged and or damned for the worst day in their life. Because if that was the case, I wouldn't be here sitting here talking to you all. So should there be a path to redemption? Is there a path to, to, to redemption? Most certainly. And, and I think that it is about number one, taking me taking accountability and, and me being you know responsible for my actions and then being open and transparent about the path that I'm taking moving forward. I, there's yeah. got to be transparency in order for there to be a space. You you said for somebody to earn trust back, that's not a given mm-hmm. that trust is gonna be earned. Yeah, mm-hmm. if, if, if I break a confidence with you, if I break your trust, you don't owe me that back. You don't have mm-hmm. to give me that back. So in order for me to even get into position where that might, be a possibility. I got to be open. I got to be honest and I got to be transparent and demonstrate to you my willingness and my desire to potentially be considered by you mm, that's to right. earn that trust. Yes, there you sir. Go. Exactly right. I don't, I'm not owed anything. Yeah. And as soon as I start thinking like that, then that's how those things happen where we have cancel culture, where I'm, I'm, I, I, my privilege is taken over, my, my, my ego and all of these other things have taken over. And, and I start to forget mm. that I'm a part of the whole. And I start to think that I'm above everyone else and I'm separate and I'm a part. And then I start not having a, a compassion and understanding for my fellow human being. Mm. So I got to learn how to be a human being all over again and demonstrate that to my fellow human beings. And there's no time that just takes the time. There, there's no takes. time limit on that. You, I don't get to tell somebody, okay, it's been long enough, get over this hurt, get over this mm-hmm. pain. I don't get to do that. My and man. I don't even get to start okay. to uh, 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 
you know, uh, engage anybody in a conversation like that. Mm. I don't have that right. Mm. Wow. Mm. I love how accountable you are. That is what is mm. most yeah. uh, moves me the most, brother. Mm. You don't deflect nothing. Yeah. Um, I hope more of us can get there. Yeah. You're impacting the world in such a beautiful way. You are changing the world, my friend. And, uh, just so grateful for you. So can we jump in? Are you cool with some rapid fire questions? I will try to have some rapid fire answers. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast, rapid fire questions. How can we encourage men to seek restitution for their actions, to seek redemption for actions that have hurt other people? Hmm. Ask them to feel into a world that they would want for their children. Mm, beautiful. What what do other people value that you do not value? Social media. <laughs> what are the key ingredients to setting up a safe space for men to be open and vulnerable with each other? Trust and modeling what it looks like to be open and vulnerable. Mm. Hmm. What can men do to create safe spaces for women? Empathy and listening. Mm -hmm. Eldra, you got a time machine. And you get a chance to go back and be there with that seven-year-old version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know you've already done this, but maybe you can mm -hmm. tell us, what do you say to him? It's not your fault. You don't have anything to be ashamed of. You are on a time machine that takes you to the future. You have now lived your life full complete. And you are now at a, a ghost at your own funeral. And there are those around uh, to share their thoughts about your life. What do you hope that you might hear them say? He cared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's do an audience one from the motor bonbon. How do you become love? You don't become love, you are love. Mm. You reconnect to it. You go back to the truth of self. When was the last time you cried? Today. I, I was crying on, on, on during this interview while, while you all were talking earlier. <laughs> when was the last time you apologized? Yesterday. When I, I called my wife, because I was taking some stuff in the town uh, and, I, and I called to check up on her to see how she was doing after she had emoted uh, what she did about, you know, feelings of overwhelm. And, and I apologize for not being in, in touch with that, being in tune with that. You know, I didn't say those words, but the action of me reaching out to check mm -hmm. in to see how she was doing. She came back, you know, and, and, and thanked me for that. Mm -hmm. So it was yesterday. And uh, for anyone listening, what would you want to say? Um, to somebody who maybe hasn't arrived yet, maybe isn't ready to sit inside a circle, maybe this conversation feels like algebra and they're just mm -hmm. doing basic math. Mm -hmm. What do you say to somebody uh, who wants to be better but doesn't know how, who wants to show up for women, who wants to show up for the world, who wants to be vulnerable but just doesn't know how? Mm-hmm. Trust yourself and step into the fear. Don't wait for the fear to disappear because it's not. Mm. Step into it. Mm. And last question. <laughs> what does it mean to be man enough? What it means to be man enough. What does it mean to be man enough? I think that's for an individual to determine for themselves. That's not something that I can look into Webster's and, and find the definition of what works as being man enough in my house might not work in somebody else's house. I don't want to put anybody else into a box. So for me, what it means to be man enough is to do just what I'm doing with my family and in the world. Hmm. We got to undefine it. Got to get rid of the boxes, which is exactly what you are doing, Eldra. Well, let me just tell you from my observation, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree that you, my friend, are the epitome of man enough. Yes, sir. 
Thank and you. I received that. <laughs> My man. Can we just start a uh, circle? Mm-hmm. Like yes. everywhere? I feel like there should be one on every block. I would love that. There should be one in every company. Mm-hmm. Eldra, how can people support your work? Mm. How can people support mm. Inside Circle and what you do? By going to our website, insidecircle.org. Uh, they can follow us and listen, like, share, and subscribe to the Inside Circle podcast. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. And as the executive director, I have a responsibility to let you know that we do accept cash, credit cards, and checks. (laughs) (laughs) And spread the word. Watch the documentary. Uh, uh, You know, reach out to us. Connect around a a, a screening. And 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 the best way, and the most important way for me to uh, support Inside Circle is find what works for you. Find your own healing. You know, it might not be inside circle. It might not be sitting in a circle. It, you know, inside circle and, and this way is not the end all be all. It's just something that I found that works for me. Mm. Find what works for you. Get in touch with the best you. If you don't mind, um, you know, we, I don't do this after every podcast um, for sure. Um, I'm going to ask if you our producers can give each other um, our numbers and I'd like to be connected to you. You are a um, a man that uh, I would love in my life personally. Um, and so if I'm not infringing on your time in your world, uh, I would love to develop that. I'm definitely open to that. My man. It's a big mistake, Eldra. It's a really, <laughs> really, really big mistake. I'm just going <laughs> to run for the hills. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, you. man. It's so good to see you. And uh sending you tons of love we're gonna take a breather uh process all of this and we will be right back this is man enough hello and welcome back to the man enough podcast and wow that was amazing (laughs) (laughs) we say that every time Uh, we do say that every time but eldra it's just so rare to i think um meet somebody who has been through what he's been through and come out on the other side like this. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't even have words. I don't have words. Just him, his accountability, yeah. his explanation of it. Yeah. I wanted to ask him where he, where he really learned that. Yeah. Because that is so powerful. I think out of everything that's been said, if they, uh, listeners walk away, if we walk away with that, and I relate because the people that have uh, forgiven me in my life are the ones that I have not asked to forgive me. Mm. That I just try to show uh, with transparency mm. um, what I'm doing, how I'm living, so that maybe they don't feel that my um, destruction was completely in vain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and when he spoke of that, I was like, yeah, man, there's mm-hmm. so many men. There was so many of us are just like afraid, like it shows weakness mm-hmm. to say that I was wrong. Yeah. Oftentimes they're like, oh, you know, sorry, but or I'm really sorry I did that to you, Liz. But, you know, I was distracted with mm-hmm. such and such rather than or you I'm know sorry what? that made you feel that way. Yes. Well, that, that's an obvious one. But off, yeah. but oftentimes it's like, I'm really sorry that I interrupted you, Liz, but I really wanted yeah. to get to the if question. If there's a but in your apology. Or, yeah, any explanation, e- never gonna even a reasonable explanation. Person, yeah. Like, why not just be like, just, mm-hmm. I'm really sorry I did that. Yes. I'm really sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry mm-hmm. I walked through the, I just did this, period. Period. And then you can explain how mm-hmm. that happened sure. through how mm-hmm. you move, now how you're moving. Mm-hmm. What, what was that like for you, Liz, listening to him? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As Liz Plank, as a woman, um, as a researcher, mm-hmm. uh, he's, I mean, he's somebody that I could have seen in the pages of your book. Like you yeah. would have gone to him and I could have seen you read a whole chapter about. Mm-hmm. Well, I did interview Sammy Rangel, who was also in a solitary confinement in a triple max prison for 18 years. Similar tragic history of sexual assault as a child, uh, grew up, you know, with violence and gangs and, and whatnot. And so there were a lot of... Um, there's a lot of not resemblances, but 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 common, you know, points there, and and the same ones that you felt, Jamie, during the interview, that you know, a lot of the men who end up doing bad things, bad things were done to them, 
Um, and I loved his answer about cancel culture. I feel like that's the best answer I've, I've ever received, which was like, it's not about getting your job back. Yeah. If that's why you're doing it, you're not doing it, right? For the right reasons. And focus on the impact, right? Mm. Amends are all about, uh, you know, making amends and it's not about earning forgiveness. People, right. women don't owe you shit. People don't owe you shit. That is like, to me, the mantra for my life. When I start getting annoying in my life, I say like, the universe doesn't owe you shit. Mm. You, you're not owed a peaceful night of rest. You're not owed a conflict-free life. You're not owed like a flight that has no delays. Like you're not, no one owes you anything. Yeah. And that's when I'm the happiest, when, when I don't mm. feel that. And so I love that he said that. I love that you said that. Mm. Yeah. You know, one of the most, one of the things that hit me uh, the hardest was when he talked about trauma centers. And I just, I just saw the ER and I've been to the ER quite a few times, but I just saw the ER and, and generally just how much care and attention is given to somebody. Um, and I just, I just wonder, I just, I see this seven year old boy going through that. I see Jamie going through what he went through and they're scared children who have been traumatized and hurt by other people and hurt people, hurt people. And what if we could heal people? He's even said healed people, heal people. And I just wonder if we could make our prison system less about punitive, you know, um, how do we isolate and and take them away so they're these bad people are not dangerous and just you know and and make it more about healing mm -hmm. i just wonder if if our world would look so different sure would <laughs> i don't know oh, i love that he f has found himself yeah um reminded of who is you know um his nobility mm -hmm. yeah. we're all created noble yeah and that that he has found that it's really beautiful and really wonderful. Uh, I would highly encourage, we don't normally say this or do this, but I would highly encourage you to consider supporting Inside Circle. Um, they're doing beautiful work. He's their first like full-time executive director. Yeah. It's really, really sweet. And um, when a nonprofit can take, can take somebody that um, went through the program and promote them to the top of the program, that's how you know they're doing the real work. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. so I just want to say kudos, uh, kudos to Inside Circle. Check them out, support their work. Yeah. And um, thank you so much for listening to the Man in the Podcast. If you like these conversations and you want to come back and hang out with us, uh, check us out wherever you get your podcasts. You can go to manenough.com slash podcast. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. Did you forget your name for a minute? So, yeah, I forgot where I was. <laughs> it's okay. He's forgotten his name plenty of times. And this is Man Enough.